and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 88, Six Pack, Tabletop Game Recommendations for a Group of Six. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Bo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, in addition to our main topic of six-player games, we've got a longer-than-usual feedback section with lots of comments on last week's topic of great sites for playing board games online. I've got a review of a two-player trick-taking game, Fox in the Forest, and we'll be wrapping up with the Bellhop's Table Talk segment, where I start off talking about a game of Clank played earlier today. Well, I don't start off, sorry, I finish off the game of Clank played earlier today as part of the Worldwide Play Day. And then we got some digital gaming going on, which includes some uh, Jaipur and Terraforming Mars, which we both played. And some thoughts on the site Happy Meeple, which features a bunch of two-player board games. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Uh, each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And you, I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Last week's topic comparing three different online gaming sites for free proved to be very popular. We got a lot of feedback on that topic, starting with Carcassonne Central Twitter, who wrote, Great summary. Have you seen Britsville while the DE slash Spiel? would add it as a lot of Euro and card implementations that are worth a look too. It's got a pretty old interface. I imagine the demand has tipped it over. I also like yourturnmyturn.com, but only because it has an implementation of Carcassonne the Castle. Fair. Well, thanks, uh, Carcassonne Central. I tried to check out Brett Spielwell. Like, we, we planned to do that episode for quite some time, and we wanted to try out as many sites as we could before doing it, and then eventually settled on what we considered the top three. So I tried. Brett Spielwell, I went to it, and the link I had, which I don't know where I got this link from, led to this site, which is this bar of color and some blinking lights, and, and it looked like, I don't know, uh, and it had this spot where you hit the play button. Everything else was in German. I would hit the play button, and it would just reload that page, and I never was able to get in and actually play it. So... I wasn't able to actually play on Brett Spielwelt, so we didn't do that. Now, when Carcassonne Central sent this tweet to me, they used a different link, and all it is is the slash spiel, right? So it's in, in the game folder, and that worked great, and I could see the site. But at that point, it's too late, right? Like, we already did the show. I couldn't get into it before we did the show. It does look pretty solid. It's a very limited game list, but it is, again, different stuff that's on the other site, so we may get back to it at some point. I took my uh, a little look at uh, yourturnmyturn.com, but I have to say I didn't even register. Mm. Their games list just wasn't offering me anything I was interested in. But I will say, if you like more classic games rather than modern, they have a great selection available of some of the old classics. By old classics, you mean like chess, checkers, Monopoly? or uh, Chess, checkers, or draft, actually. Uh, but they even have Connect Four, Battleship. Um, like just okay. a, a really good range of your kind of standard, what everyone outside of the hobby world thinks of as board games. <laughs> All right, are really fair there. enough. Well, what we'll do is for other people to check it out, we'll toss in links to both. I'll make sure to put the Brett Spiel Welt link that has the slash spiel that works better than the other one I had, and we'll throw in the links to the other, and people can check those out on their own. Now, what I'm thinking we're probably going to do. Uh, because these aren't the only, this isn't the only feedback we got about other sites is toss. We might do another return to that topic. Like we'll do lesser known gaming sites or some of the least popular sites or sites you may not know about to play games online. And we'll throw our opinions on those with pros and cons, but that's going to take us some work because we got to go do the research and play some games on the sites. All right. Well, on the same topic, Noam, uh, Noam Bergman writes, thanks. Useful stuff. Any thoughts on screen size? 
I only have experience with Board Game Arena of these three, I find I have to scroll a lot on my laptop to find things. Well, thanks for the comment, Gnome. Well, so pro tip, um, on all these sites that we featured, boy, uh, Board Game Arena, Boitajou, and Yukata, you can zoom in and out. Uh, it's the same way you zoom in and out in Chrome or your browser, in that you can hold down the control key and hit the plus or minus on the number pad, or you can hold down the control key and use the scroll wheel on your mouse, assuming your mouse has a scroll wheel. I don't think you can get mice without scroll wheels anymore. Now, I did find I had to do this for some of the games on some of the sites to be able to see everything. Plus, I found it very useful on sites where there were multiple player boards to be able to zoom out to see everyone's board at once. And this, usually, once you zoom out, you don't need to scroll around. Now, I will also note that one of the features I liked about Yukata in particular was the games come up in windowed mode, and as you resize the windows, the games tended to shrink or grow. Now, I say tended because it's not everything, because just like we said last week when talking about Yukata, it's a very mixed bag for what you get with each game, but most of them resized based on the window. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I find one of the things I find about Board Game Arena is even when there is a need to scroll, uh, it's usually for extra information. Uh, in order for you to play right then and there, the information is in front of you. Mm -hmm. But if you want to check on some other things, then you might have to scroll around a little more. Now, up next, Sal de Michigan, at Michigan underscore Sal on Twitter, writes, thanks for the great summary, exactly what I was looking for. Awesome. Uh, you're very welcome, Sal. I'm, I'm really glad that this, I, this one really seems to have taken off. This topic, people seem to really appreciate. And I think it's awesome that our people are finding it so useful. That's great. That's what we're trying to do every week. Well, Craig Maloney has a specific online game they want us to check out. Okay. One thing of note is that Boitageu has the solo mode for Nations the Dice Game. Mm. So if you want a quick 20-minute game and don't feel like waiting for other players, players that's an option thanks for this review really helpful oh you're welcome craig and thanks for the comment uh yet another game tempting me to play on boatajou <laughs> i gotta say that's the key really for all these sites is if the game you want to play the most is on that site that's probably going to be the site you're going to want to use though i gotta say boatajou is rough just like that subscription model and what you don't get without it that, that's going to make it rough I'll see. Maybe you can play Nations without subbing, so I might check that one out. Again, we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. All right, well, Jeremy Robinson at Shimokita Jer on Twitter points out something that we missed, or at least didn't discuss during our site comparison last week. They write, great comparison of the three sites, but I'm surprised you didn't touch on what I think is the biggest one. Yukata and Boitajou are really designed for turn-based rather than real-time gaming. That makes a huge difference when you're trying to play live, as BGA keeps you informed about what other players are doing in a way the others don't prioritize. Some of the implementations are great, and this doesn't matter. The Yukata versions of Rajas of the Ganges and Voyages of Marco Polo, for example. But others leave you staring at an unmoving screen until the other player clicks that finish button. This also leads to the odd table uh, swapping thing on Yukata. I often have several games going at once, and if my turn comes up in another while I'm playing one real time, it forces me to go take a turn <laughs> at the other before I can continue. Uh, Jeremy makes a really good point here that makes a lot of sense. Now, when we were trying out Yukata and Watazu, we, at the time, were playing real time games because we both were online at the same time, or Deanna was on at the same time, and we were playing pretty much everything real time. Now, what I did notice. The site seemed to be a little more turn-based focused. We never actually stopped and tried it out, except for the fact there were some games we left hanging until it finished off the next day. We played everything real time. So that actually explains uh, to me a lot better why the interfaces on those two sites are so different than Board Game Arena. Because Board Game Arena literally does either, and it works great at both. You can play turn-based or you can play real time. And the interface doesn't change between them, but the interface is designed to work for both. Um, so what I'm going to have to do, I think, at this point, is I'm going to go update the blog article. I haven't done it yet uh, to update it to include this information because I would say it's definitely a pro under Board Game Arena for supporting both, and I would say a con on the others for being turn-based focused. Now, if all you play is turn-based, that's fine, but you know what? Sometimes you want to be able to take your turns in succession and get a game done in 50 minutes instead of four days. I think previously to our quarantine, most people were probably playing turn-based, and that was really yes. what the the market was driving for, but we're all sitting around in front of our computers now, so real-time is a major benefit in this day yeah. and age. Now, one final positive comment about last week's topic. 
Luke Shiras writes, thanks for the comparison. I've been wanting to do this, but wanted to start with the best choice for me. Oh, you're welcome, Luke. Uh, what I did write, Luke, and I didn't get a follow-up, is which of the three he was going to head towards. So I say if it was going to be based on the games or if he was going right to Board Game Arena. But you are welcome, and thank you for the comment. Well, on to another topic. We've got some more two-player game recommendations, <laughs> this time from Jay Shapinsky, who writes, Kahuna, Eve Ho, Odin's Ravens, Ticket to Ride Switzerland, mm -hmm. The Settlers of Catan, The Card Game, and Longhorn. Oh, thanks for the list, Jay. Um, always glad to get more two-player game lists. That, that is definitely still our most popular topic on the blog right now. It's topic gets the most comments, and people love their two-player games. So going through a bit of these, um, I don't own it, but I have played Odin's Ravens. A local gamer, Ross, had it, and I played it. I liked it quite a bit, but I only played it once, so that didn't end up on the list because I, I don't have enough experience with it. Uh, Heave Ho, I've definitely seen many times at game stores and online, not played it. Uh, the Ticket to Ride Switzerland, though, had me interested. I had to look that one up because I'm like, why would you want that for two-player? And it ends up it's a two- to three-player version of Ticket to Ride only, whereas normally Ticket to Rides, I think it plays five players. So that's good to see because, like, I really like New York. Now, New York isn't designed for two players but plays really well at two players, and I love how quick it is. I'd be really curious to try Switzerland because I'm not a huge Ticket to Ride fan, but I did like New York better, and I think Switzerland might be a sweet spot in between without having the big epic game. Well, not the Ticket to Ride's all that epic, but the, the full game, a slightly distilled down experience for only two players sounds cool. Um, as for Settlers of Catan, the card game, this one I own. I love it. It's got some really neat stuff, the way you turn your cards and they improve. But it is so out of print that I actually took it off the list. Like it's, I, I've actually started removing some of the out of print games that are on our game recommendation list because I have people email me saying, you know, I really want to pick this game out, but it's out of print. So unfortunately, Settlers of Catan, the card game, is long out of print. Now, I do know there's a more modern card game, but the fact that Jay is specifically saying the Settlers of Catan, the card game. I think he's talking about the one I'm thinking of, which is out of print, not the more modern watch, which as far as I can tell, isn't rated as well. All right. Well, as usual, we'll toss those two player game suggestions in our show notes. We're going to finish up this week with a couple of mm -hmm. comments on our Pulsar 2849 review. First, a question from Oculus Orbis who writes, mm -hmm. what's an engine builder? I have a good question. Uh, this is one of the gaming terms we covered in our game mechanics episode. And I've gotten our list of game mechanics on the blog, which I'll drop a link to that because we haven't actually talked about that. That's almost two years old at this point. So an engine builder is a game where the players need to build some form of system to score points. The system starts small but grows as the game goes on. And scoring usually escalates as the game continues as well. Actual ways this done is in different games is from a different mechanics. Now, looking at Pulsar specifically, there's a couple, two main engines you can work on. One of them is building transmission arrays. Transmission arrays start earning you resources or points every round, which will then allow you to do more stuff like build more arrays or work on the other aspect. And the other big aspect of engine building in Pulsar is building the gyrodyne. So in Pulsar, the whole thing is you are trying to build an energy network to send energy back home, and that's you get points for that. So you start off the game with no gyrodynes, but then you're going to go out there, you're going to claim a Pulsar, you're going to buy a gyrodyne, and you're going to spin it up. So that's building the engine. You have three steps to build that engine. And then it's going to start generating points, one to three points a turn. So maybe by the first turn of the game, you might get one up and spinning. Usually by the second turn, you can get one going. But by the end of the game, you might have four or five gyrodynes going, generating you 20 points every turn. So that's the engine, the slow ramp up of one point. And by turn three, you're doing six points. And by turn five, you're doing 12 points. And by turn seven, you're doing 20 points. And that ramp up. So I hope that explains a little better what an engine builder is or what we mean by an engine builder. All right, well, finally, a question from Chris Groff about Pulsar. Sounds interesting. Like a good puzzle worth solving. Mm -hmm. Is there any player interaction? Uh, that's a good question, Chris. Uh, that's something we don't, maybe I need to focus on a little bit more in our in our reviews, how, how much player interaction there is in these games. So in Pulsar, this is not a 4X. Uh, this isn't an exploration game. There is no, no extermination. There's no direct conflict. There's no way to attack another player or take their stuff or make them lose something. But there's lots of indirect interaction. So one of the things is only one player gets each die, right? So you're drafting. So there's that the hat, hate drafting of that, making sure you get dice that your opponents don't. Uh, then there's the sliding track 
tracks that are there. There's a technology track and a player order track. That's a big deal. Who's going to get the lead? And the technology track actually gives you cubes that can be traded to get those bonus dice. And if you remember our review, those bonus dice are huge. So where you are on the track is extremely important. Um, the dice you draft, including um, art, of, of course, is influenced. Um, there's also an area majority element. So each system you discover is going to have so many planets from two to four. Some of those planets are blue and some are barren. People who land on blue planets get a bonus. Barren planets, they get nothing. They just mark that they own that settlement. So that is a definite race to get to those planets first, and you can compete over those. So who gets to the blue planets first? Um, also, like some of the systems only have two planets. So if you're playing with more than two players, you're going to be SOL. You can't even land there. And then the pulsars. There's only so many pulsars on the board. And they're pretty sp spread out. And when you claim a pulsar, you put a disc of your color on it. It's yours. No one can take it from you. So that's another way. Um, when there's only, with the technology tree, only two players can have a given technology. And when you play two players, that drops down to only one player can have a given technology. So there's always a, a race or a competition for which technologies people can build. So one player can claim it. And they actually get it exclusively for one turn. Then the next turn, a second player can go grab a technology. Uh, then there's bonus points for building two of the same gyrodyne. So there's the gyrodynes are number one, two, and three. Well, the first player to build two ones, the first player to build two twos, and the first player to build two threes gets seven points, which is pretty big. And then the second player to do that also gets four, and then the third player doesn't get anything for it. And then there's the whole transmitter erase. Um, there's only three that come up every turn. And if you're playing four players, someone won't be able to buy a transmitter, no matter what. Plus, there's often competition for who gets the best transmitter first so overall nothing in your face but a whole bunch of i need to get this thing before you do or i want to take this so you don't get it all right well that uh, that sums up we did talk about the lack of it being uh, the lack of that fourth x but i guess we didn't really actually talk about what you could do right <laughs> in there so makes sense well that's it for this week's comments thanks to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. Gotta get used to hitting that. I gotta rearrange my buttons. I keep going into the wrong, oh, uh, yeah. the wrong scene first. A couple of quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, leave a like, hit the bell, or just leave a comment. We, like most creators, grow only by your interaction with us. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, usually on Wednesday, I send out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. It's the best way to keep track of everything we put out each week and make sure you don't miss anything. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Oh, does is Renegade in our chat today? I did not see them. So Renegade Games is currently doing a weekly worldwide play date where they feature one of their games and encourage people around the world to play the game at the same time. As part of this, they have been broadcasting worldwide events that people are encouraged to incorporate into their game. Now, we've been trying to take part of these every week and streaming our games. A couple weeks ago, we played Fox in the Forest. Earlier today, Deanna and I played Clank, a deck-building adventure, and we've been having a ton of fun with this event. The next event hits on April 29th, and assuming we have the game, Mo and Deanna yep. will be going live at 3 p.m. Eastern and taking part in next week's event. If we can find out before the end of the show what the game is, we will announce it, though I have not heard yet. But I am really hoping we have it, because I've been having a lot of fun doing this. So I'm looking forward to next Wednesday. So if it does happen, 3 p.m. Eastern, we'll be going live right here, twitch.tv slash tabletop bell off. All right, this is something new that I did yesterday. There's a local gamer and musician, Christopher Marentet. He's one of the people behind The World Is Ours, or The Earth Is Ours. Uh, a party game, a, a multiplayer card game that was kickstarted a couple of years back. He's been doing something pretty cool while stuck in quarantine. So he's been hosting a live show on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. All of them streamed at once because he's not monetizing, so he can get away with doing that. Um, and he's calling it Face to Facebook Livecast. That's the name he came up with. And it's kind of like a DJ show where he plays music. He has local musicians on, plays local music videos from Detroit and Windsor, and he chats with local community members. And I had the pleasure of being on a show last night about talking about podcasting and about digital media and quite a bit about tabletop gaming, how great it is to do right now in this period of isolation, how it's something to keep your mind off everything and something to do with the people you're stuck with. 
So while the show is obviously over, you can catch the VOD version on YouTube on Christoph's channel. We'll toss a link to that in the show notes. If you skip ahead to about the three hour and 29 minute mark for the segment featuring our bellhop. That's a long show, but he's doing it every night. I don't know how he's managing to keep up and keep going, but I do appreciate what Christopher's doing. It's, it's really cool. All right, next week is the last Wednesday of the month, and I hope by now everyone knows what that means, which we always tend to forget. We forgot last month. We won't forget again. Uh, we are going to have an Ask Us Anything, an Ask AMA, whatever you want to call it. We are going to be taking your questions live from the chat room. Gaming-related would be great, but they don't have to be. You know what? It really is an Ask Us Anything. If there's something you want to know about Sean or I or Deanna, feel free to ask whatever you want. Uh, we'll be going live at our usual time, 9 p.m. Eastern. That'll be on April the 29th. We're going to be answering your questions right here, live on Twitch. Ask anything you want, and we will answer you live. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. Yeah, I, do. I wasn't reading ahead to realize I'm about to repeat myself here when and- just keep saying, just keep showing up at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. How many times can we say it? We got to say it, what, nine times for it to stick in people's heads or something like that? Seven, I think seven is enough. Seven. seven, is that what it is? All right, we got quite a few people watching, which is awesome, but our chat room's a little quieter tonight. Not a lot going on. There's not too much going on. Poncho likes my shirt. I've got it. It's a D20 with a one, and it says Crit Happens. I couldn't okay. even tell you where this came from. Uh, I like Sean. Sean's awesome. It says I Speed Board Game. That's a good one. I do have to thank May Suggins for subscribing. That's fantastic. I love to see it. Uh, if you want to greatly wanna, appreciate that. If you want your own I Speak Board Game shirt, uh, that's actually from Chris Cormier. Uh, yeah, so it's Geeky store. Goodies. Geeky Goodies. Uh, not a sponsor. I've got some shirts from Chris. Not a sponsor, just a fan. I don't think that's where this one came from. I think this might have come in a loot crate. I don't know. Deanna probably gave it to me. <laughs> my kids and my wife buy me most of my geeky shirts. I don't buy many of them myself. Drinking a Green Mountain coffee tonight. The new coffee maker is working out well, but we haven't had anything new to review. So no no shiny new reviews. Um, no packages have shown up to unbox either. I do plan on doing some um, unboxing videos, but you know what? I got a problem with one of my two of my fingers right now, actually, that D doesn't want me to record unboxing videos because he thinks people like get grossed out by it and be like, go to the hospital, man. So <laughs> we're holding off. So I got some stuff to unbox. Poncho's got pizza rolls. I'm jealous. Yep, yep. I'm definitely jealous. I miss pizza. That's that's probably the thing I miss. Well, Panzerati about as much, if not more, than pizza. I need a Windsor pizza. That's probably going to be the first thing I do when this is over. We're going to go out to uh, Armando's Pizza Bar and get a, a Roni Rubber deep dish pizza. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we're, we used to do pizza yeah, weekly-ish. I mean, not quite as often as you necessarily, but weekly-ish. And we're still doing it, but a lot less often. So maybe like once every three weeks we'll treat to yeah. pizza. But, See, we're still not doing takeout at all. So, like, we we had some um, we had some frozen pizzas that were decent, but those went the first week. So, <laughs> we haven't had them since. Yeah, no, we've got a we've got a, a a place I trust nearby, and I've been in there. I've seen them in masks and uh, you know masks and gloves working. So, I don't know. I feel pretty confident once in a, once in a while. Um, and uh, you know, otherwise, just stay away from people. Mask and glove as required, and. Stay home, folks. Stay home. (laughs) I haven't been in a business in a long time now, four weeks now since I've been in anywhere. I've gotten some curbside where I don't even talk to anyone, and they just opened my trunk. And we've gotten lots of packages delivered that we let sit for a while, but that's about it. Well, unfortunately, we still don't have a good grocery option here. Like, we got the produce. The produce is fine. We're we're great on produce. But for, like, cheese and meat, I, I can't wait two weeks for a pickup. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't I don't know what I want two weeks in advance sort of thing. Or we didn't. We, we're on a cycle we, where we need the food. I almost need to go shopping and then start ordering the next day. Yeah. Um, which no, is ridiculous. See, see yeah. we're lucky for cheese in particular. There's a place called the Cheese Bar that's doing that, – that's always been awesome. It's someone that we've supported for a long time. They used to be at all the local farmer's markets, and we would buy cheese off them. And it's all Canadian Ontario cheese. Yeah. And they're doing uh, drop-off at the door. Okay. And they do have some meat products, so we've done that. Um, we're also getting like a monthly meat thing, and I totally forget the name of the company, but maybe we'll grab it in the after show because I don't know they might deliver to you guys, but it's been fantastic. 
I'll get the name of it. Plus, it's one of those, if you sign up with ours, we both get $50 credit. So right. if you want to get some meat. So that's what we're doing for meat and cheese. Um, the grocery store we talked about, the, the DeMarco's that we've been picking up, has been great for produce, canned goods, potato, well, potatoes, produce. Um, but as far as we can tell, they're vegan, right. like which we've never really noticed. But like most of the stuff we're getting, like they don't have meat like at right. all. There's no meat there. So the meat, we have a different source. And I'm sure some people on Twitter saw our bagel shipment from Montreal. Yep. So it's one of those, you know, if you're going to buy online and you're going to have to buy bagels, why not go right to the source, right? Yep. That, that was our thinking there. Same with, like, for the kids for Easter, we did Purdy's chocolates because we're like, well, if we're going to have to order chocolate online, yeah, yeah. instead of supporting Amazon, let's get Purdy's. Yeah, yeah, go big or go home. <laughs> So yeah, that, that that's been the, the Vienna has discovered lots of interesting places to shop online, and I have a feeling once things change, once things go back to normal, we will probably still be doing some of the online ordering yeah. due to this. Well, I don't know about online, but I know that this uh, this farmers market, you know, farmer literally yeah. farmer near us, there, you know, an apple and cider place where we'd occasionally stop in during apple season or to pick up yep. some cider and donuts. They're gonna have a lot of our business now. Yeah, because, exactly. Because not only do they have a great selection. But they're doing it right. Like the way yep. they're handling customers is just fantastic. So I've tweeted uh, good. I, I've tweeted out to them. Sherry's shared them on Facebook. So, uh, you know, they're definitely going to uh, keep with our business. That's excellent. All right. Back to the gaming. All right. <laughs> We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight's question comes from Christopher Marentet, host of the Face to Facebook live cast that Mo was on recently. As part of the show, Chris asks, What if you are in my situation? I have a family of six people, including myself, so it's a large group. What if you happen to be quarantined with a large group of people? What would your game recommendations be for a group like mine? Well, thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, now, we've talked about two-player games many times. Uh, two-player co-op, two-player date night, two-player two games. People ask all the time. We've done three-player games and three-player games with a toddler. Uh, plus, speaking of toddlers, we've done all kinds of kids' recommendations. We even did a five-player after-dinner game episode. But you know what? This is the first time anyone has asked about six-player games. Yep. And to be fair, this is generally something we'd consider more of a party game topic. Yeah. But it sounds like Chris has a party ready made there at home all the time. Very true. So before I get into games that are great with six players, I do want to start suggesting something completely different. Because uh, six players, six is a secret number for me. It's a tipping point. Six is a, a magic number when it comes to a board game group to me. Because once I hit six, that's when I stop trying to look for the game to play with the group. Once I hit six, that's when I personally split the group. I go into two groups of three and play two different three-player games. Now, the reason for this is a combination of overall game time and downtime during the game. Because I find once you get up to six players, most games tend to go very long. Like games on average, and this is a, a huge generalization, but we'll say take about 15 minutes to half an hour per player for your average game. Once you're up to six players, even a quick game, you're looking at an hour and a half to three hours. And that's for a, a, like an average game, right? Like that's not a heavier game or a long game or an epic game. That's just like your normal one hour game slot becomes a three hour game slot. The other problem is downtime, the time between turns. Unless you're gonna play a game with simultaneous play, which we're gonna suggest a few later, it can be a very long time before you get to actually take your turn in a six player game. Five other people have to decide what they're doing and then do whatever needs to be done in the board game to do those things. And that can be more downtime than some people are going to want to wait. Yeah, a perfect example of this was my first time with King of Tokyo. We yeah. played with a full table, plus actually an extra monster thrown in. Mm -hmm. By the time the dice got around to me, not only were my choices seriously limited, but I already sort of lost interest. Yeah. Since that game in particular doesn't have much grab until you're involved in the action. Yeah. So, and a lot. A lot of games are like that. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to say playing six with six players is bad or terrible or necessarily terrible. It's just over time, having done this and hosted a lot of public play events and hosted events at game stores, that when having large groups, that most groups of people will have more fun playing quicker games in groups of three. 
But you know what? Sometimes you want everyone to play together, right? If you're doing a family game night, you probably want everyone to play together. Or maybe you don't have a large game selection. So you only have, or like out of the group, you're the game teacher, or there's only one game teacher. So you can't split into two groups because you don't have someone to teach the games. There are definitely reasons to play with six. And we're going to assume that Chris wants to play with six. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, sort of shifting to that non-six thing, one of the great things about a group as large as six is that you're able to balance people's likes and dislikes more easily. When mm -hmm. there are only three people, if one person doesn't like a certain type of game, that becomes very limiting. But with six people, even if two or three people don't like a certain type, that's yeah. still three other people who, are pl who can play that type of game. But then you get into table space problems, but that's for another show. Yeah, true, true, true. So... With that out of the way, let's take a look at some great games that are actually really good with six players. All right. So Chris's question was asked during this period of social distancing and social isolation. I'm going to assume that people have a lot of time on their hands. They're stuck at home with these people. So as I suggest on our podcast about the best games to play while well, stuck, stuck at home, that's about four episodes ago now, that, man, it, time flies in a way like man we we've been doing this whole stuck at home thing for too long but it's a period like this right when you've got more time on your hands than normal that i still think is the great time to bring out those epic long event games the ones that i used to say you had to create a facebook event and plan dinner in the middle of the event these these are the kind of games i think are perfect for six people because a lot of these games are big group games that take a long time and of course, the biggest, most well-known of these that almost every gamer has heard of, it's reached legendary status, is Twilight Imperium. This epic 4X sci-fi game is now on its fourth printing, which actually boasts a really quick playtime of four to eight hours, compared to the original, which was known to hit 12 hours regularly. There is no sci-fi game as big or epic as this one, and I gotta say, it is worth taking the time to play. Like, even if you play for the full eight hours, it just doesn't feel like it. It's just, it's a rewarding experience, and the time actually kind of flies by, even at high player counts, because there's so much to think about, so much to do, that while other players are going, you're planning your own conquest of the stars. Just remember, stay hydrated, and <laughs> make sure you don't set it up on your dinner table that you all six have to eat at at some point during that time. <laughs> Very true. So that was Twilight Imperium. All right, for something with a very similar feel, but much shorter playing time than Twilight Imperium, check out Eclipse. Uh, you're basically doing the same thing with a totally different set of mechanics and less minutia, less details. Things are kind of more zoomed out, more of an overview. There's less of a learning curve. There's a lot more exploration because the board's not set. You're flipping stuff over as you go through, but you still get that build up a fleet, explore the galaxy, exploit the systems, and of course the extermination while you're fighting each other. Now, there is a brand new printing of this one out. It's just getting to Kickstarter backers. It's not at retail yet. Um, you can see the copy behind me. It's still in shrink. I have not had a chance to check this out. The original version is fantastic, though. I still think the original is worth picking up. Um, reviews, there's a few initial reviews of the new edition out. do sound like it's an improvement on the original. So if you can get either version of Eclipse, it sounds like they're worth picking up. All right, and that was Eclipse. Next, for something a little more down-to-earth, Formula D, or Formula Day, if you happen to pick up the, the German version. This is a racing game that plays 10 people and plays it well, and it works great with six. You play a full game of this, which I don't know many people who do because of the time it takes. You actually play three races. You do one lap solo with no one else playing, and depending on how many turns it takes you to do, that gives you your ranking, your pole position for playing the full game. And then at that point, you play through two full two lap games that is enough to keep a busy a group busy for a weekend in my opinion because you split those plays out so on friday night you do your race for pole position on saturday you do your first race and then on sunday you do your finish race now it is enough you can sit down and play it all at once so i gotta say it's probably gonna be a bit much formula d at once to me uh this is a dead simple game using the basic rules uh will wheaton did a show on tabletop that showed off the basic rules it's it's all a matter of shifting your car into whatever gear and rolling a die based on what gear you're in it's pretty much that simple but then if you are more of a hardcore gamer gamer you like the minutia if you like the details or you're a gearhead you can try the advanced rules where you've got rules for image da engine damage and tire wear and you get the full formula one experience 
or even more interestingly, in the American version, the Formula D version, if you flip the board over, you can do street racing, which the mechanics are the same, but different types of tracks and different miniatures to use. Interesting. Lots of uh, lots of racing fans out there who are missing out on their experiences right now, despite the fact that some uh, some leagues are trying digital racing. Yep. <laughs> so you can try your own racing for the weekend and use Formula D. All right, this is another one. Uh, earlier in the show, we were talking about feedback. I talked about not usually liking to put on games that are out of print, but I broke the rules here because this is Battlestar Galactica because you're never going to be able to find this for a reasonable price. I don't think it's ever coming back, but this is one of the few social deduction games that I love. And I want to throw this on the list, one, for how much I love this game, and second, because talking to Chris last night, I found out he's a huge role player. He's into role-playing games, and Battlestar Galactica definitely has a role-playing element. Now, I will say, this is actually better at five, but it works with six. Now, this is a game where you are trying to get the Galactica to make it to Cobalt before running out of either food, people, or morale. The thing is, some of the players are actually Cylons and trying to prevent that from happening. All right, and that was Battlestar Galactica. Now, a classic game, Power Grid, from 2004. This is still one of my favorite games of all time. This is one of the games that opened my eyes to the world of German-style games and sparked my love for heavier economic-based board games. You're going to expand your network and constantly work to upgrade your power plants while making sure you watch the market and keep enough money to buy the resources you need to power those plants. Now, yes, I know it sounds dry and boring, but I think this is one of the best board gaming experiences that has ever been published. It's engaging if you are and, and the, I've heard people complain it's math the game. Yes, there's a lot of math. But you know, it's money math. It's addition, subtraction. All right. And that was Power Grid. All right, next, six players. It's going to take you a while, but you know what? That's what we're looking at, Epic Games. That's Caverna, the Cave Farmers. This is a brilliant update to Agricola from Uwe Rosenberg, where he's trying to catch people's interest from swapping it to raising cows and planting fields to playing dwarves, raising cows and mining minerals. It uh, worked for me. Besides what I think is a much cooler and more engaging theme, Caverna actually plays up to seven players. Whereas Agricola is out for Chris because it only plays five. There are a number of changes to the basic gameplay that I personally think make Caverna more tight and more rewarding and also more forgiving. It's not just about trying to feed your family and not starving every turn. The only problem here, though, is once you get up to six players and seven's worse, the downtime can be bad. This is a game where I wouldn't be upset if people jump on their forms waiting for their turns or if they even leave the table, do something else and be like, hey, Chris, it's your turn. Come on back. Like you, you're gonna you're gonna take a while playing this, but I do think it's worth it. So we can use it in real in real life turn based mode rather than real time yes. play. <laughs> and I like how you b uh, pronounced it both Agricola and Agricola during that during that mention. I gotta covered, keep it covered. covered we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta hit all the bases. <laughs> but that recommendation was for Caverna, the cave farmers. <laughs> All right, a last-minute addition to the list. This was not in my show notes until I was packing up the games put behind me for the show. And Deanna pointed out this one plays six players, and I totally missed this one. And this is another one I think needs to be on the list for Chris's sake, because, again, he's into storytelling and role-playing. That's Tales of the Arabian Nights. In this game, you take on the role of a wanderer in the time of Shahrazad and Sinbad. You're going to travel around, meet interesting people, go on quests, accumulate treasure, and this is all done through a very well-done choose-your-own-adventure-style storybook. Uh, this is one where you're going to be told you see a beggar, and you're going to pick one of six ways to approach that beggar. And then based on the direction you took, if you approached aggressively or if you went up cautiously, you're going to get a different result. This one, I got to say, isn't much of a game to me. Like, you're not playing this game to win. You're not trying to get the most points. You play this game as an experience and end up telling some awesome stories by the end of that experience. And that is Tales of the Arabian Nights. All right, so that's the big epic long game. So let's go to some less epic games. These are games you can finish a little more quickly in your average game night and possibly play two or three games in one night because you can fit these games in. You don't need to, uh, you, you don't have to worry about taking up the kitchen table until dinner. You'll be able to finish in time to clear it off and set the plates. So the first one I've got is Between Two Cities. 
Now, what I love about this game is the fact that it totally negates the fact that you have to worry about how many people you're playing with because everyone plays simultaneously. You play at the same time. There is pretty much no downtime in this game. Now, in this game, you are drafting tiles to build two cities, one on your left and one on your right. And the thing is, so is the person on your left and your right. And you have a city in common with each of them, which is really neat. So you're working with your neighbors to build cities on each side. But only your weakest city is going to score points at the end of the game. It's a really brilliant system that works really well. And no, I have not tried Between Two Castles and Mad King Ludwig. I hear it's really good. I just don't have a copy. So I don't know if that is an improvement on it, but that is a new fantasy implementation. All right. And that was Between Two Cities. Next, Seven Wonders. Uh, this is the game that gets most recommended at public play events I'm at. If you hit six people, someone in there is going to say, let's play Seven Wonders. If you hit seven people, they're definitely going to say Seven Wonders. Uh, this is a pretty quick-to-teach game. Uh, plays ridiculously fast if everyone knows how to play. It is a lightning-quick game if everyone knows what they're doing. The thing is, make sure you don't think of this as a gateway game. Don't be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm home, like Chris, sitting thinking he's got a couple non-gamers in that group of six. You probably don't want to break out Seven Wonders right away. Seven Wonders isn't is simple to gamers because we get the concepts, but certain things like having to buy resources from your neighbors can really trip up new gamers. That is Seven Wonders. All right, you've heard me recommend this one before, Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Because it is really rare to find a, a cooperative game with such a high player count. There just aren't a lot of six-player cooperative games. Now, all your Pandemic games are out. They top at five, and that's only with an expansion. So this is a co-op game that plays with six players right out of the box. And personally, I think it's a better cooperative game in the first place. Just something about fighting fires and saving a kitty from a burning house is just more impactful than removing virus cubes from a board. Plus, who wants to think about Pandemics right now? Absolutely. And that was Flashpoint Fire Rescue. All right. One, well, Sean mentioned at the top of the show here when talking about games with too much downtime is King of Tokyo. This is Kaiju Yahtzee. Big monsters battling in a King of the Hill dice game. Um, six is the max player count. Trust me, don't play at seven, as we mentioned earlier. Don't try to add the extra monsters you might own. Stop at six, really, if you really do. Um, you're going to want to play this one also with the expansion, in my opinion. You want to pick up the power-up expansion. That makes the game asymmetrical. I personally won't play the game without it. But this is a great one if you've got kids or non-gamers because everyone kind of gets Yahtzee. They're going to roll the dice three times. They're going to pick which set to keep and then do something because of it. Uh, really, a really good, light, quick game that I like. This is one I personally like to use to open the night up to get everyone talking and get everyone socializing. Yeah, don't let my bad experiences with it sour you on it. <laughs> We made a mistake. <laughs> that was King of Tokyo. All right, next I have what happens when hardcore gamers get a hold of Battleship, and that is Captain Sonar. This is a turn-based or simultaneous game where six players are going to split your team into two three-person teams, and each player is going to take on a different role in a submarine. The goal is to locate and sink the other team's sub before they do the same with you. Now, you start off turn-based, so everyone learns their position, like so the, the weapons officer and the engineer and the, and the navigator all know what they're doing, but then as soon as everyone's got their roles down, turn it off, start playing real-time, and you have a raucous good time. This game gets, uh, it just, it, it's a loud, almost party atmosphere while playing a fairly serious game. And that was Captain Sonar. All right, here's one I need to break out again. One I tend to forget about, that's Colt Express. This is a very cool programmed movement game. So think like Robo Rally, but it's set in the Old West and you are playing a train robber. You have to program your moves to move around the train, avoid the warden, and grab or steal loot from the other players. Different event cards make it hard to predict what other players are doing because, for example, when the train goes under a tunnel, you're going to play your cards face down. And then no one knows where you're moving after that. As an added bonus, the game just looks sweet because it's a full 3D cardboard train that you move your meeples on. And I got to say, it's frivolous, but it actually comes with some like 3D cactus and scenery that just, I don't know, I, I like it. it. You put it next to the train and it just looks cool. And that was Colt Express. All right. I swear we can't do a game recommendation episode without me mentioning Pitch Car. 
Uh, now, I prefer this one with eight players. It's fun with any player count. I've even had fun with two. Six people, pitch car works great. There's just enough cars to get in the way of each other without it being crowded. This is still probably my favorite dexterity game of all time. Um, it's accessible to almost everyone. You can play it with kids. Uh, everyone I've showed it to just gets it and likes it and enjoys it. What's kind of cool is about this is if you want to convince people to play games and they're like, oh, I don't like board games, right? So if you're stuck with five other people and there's someone there that's like, oh, I don't like board games. Well, this is almost more of an activity or a sport. Like you're flicking it. Like this is shuffleboard more than Monopoly, right? So it's it's a little easier to sell on non-gamers. That one thing about Pitch Car is it does take up space and the kind of space you use matters too. Uh, if you've got some older folks, you might not want to, want to be doing it on the floor so the people weren't standing up and getting down yeah. too much. Uh, but if you don't have a big enough table, you're a little more limited on what kind of a track you can set up. So while space is an issue, Pitch Car just is a great game. I, I, is there anyone who has ever not liked Pitch Car when you set it up? I mean, no, <laughs> no. There are people who've liked it more than others, but I'm, I've never had anyone like, oh, that was terrible. I hate yeah. it. I'll never play again. Yep. Uh, like Deanna's even... not a big Deanna's not a big dexterity game player but even, i can get her to play even when you gave between the table jumps i still kept playing <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that was terrible that was a bad idea now the base set of pitch car you can fit on a three by three table it's not the most interesting race but it definitely works definitely better with more expansions and sets and big setups though and that was pitch car and they keep putting out expansions for it yes I got to get, that's, that's, that's my goal. Hello. We're not going to Origins this year, is I was able to get a, I wasn't expecting it, but I was able to get a review copy of Vinhos. I'm like, if you were able to give me Vinhos, you'll give me the loop to loop for Pitch Car next year. That's my goal. Right. Is, uh, I, that's a life goal for next year, or a business goal, I guess, at this point. All right, I mentioned, um, oh, I almost jumped ahead, sorry. Uh, this is another one that I think, again, it's going to be good for Chris because he's into role playing. That's Shadows Over Camelot. This is another rare social deduction game that I actually enjoy. And the thing I found is that I like social deduction games where you play a role, where you play a character, where it's not just lie to your friends. And that is what Shadows Over Camelot is. This is a semi-cooperative role-playing game, basically. Everyone takes on the role of a knight of the round table, and you're going to work to defend Camelot and complete various quests. The interesting bit is one of the knights might, and no might, be a traitor who's working for the forces of darkness. One of the cool things about this game that I've always liked and which makes it great for public play events is that people can jump in and out of the game once it's started. So that's always nice. So if you've got someone who has to, you know, who either gets sick of playing or someone wants to join in part way, you can do that in this game. And that was Shadows Over Camelot. All right, next I mentioned program movement earlier with uh, Colt Express. We get to the oldest and best program movement game, uh, Robo Rally. Although I, I can't actually confirm it was the first, but it's definitely the one people know the most, the most popular. Uh, think logo, turbo graphics, right? You program your robot to move through a maze of obstacles and be the first person to hit all the objective cards in play, which would be dead simple, except your program cards are random, randomized, and while all the other players have a bunch of armed push robots out there trying to do the exact same thing. Uh, my only caveat here is that I do prefer the older editions of the game. Well, the new version works. It just doesn't have the complexity and depth of tactics and strategy, the older version. But it does mean the new one is more accessible to new gamers. Absolutely. And that was Robo Rally. And we've even talked about that on how to play that with social distancing. Yes, we have. <laughs> uh, next, uh, classic Catan. Catan and all of its various sub versions and isotopes tend to have five to six player expansions uh, again i almost forgot about this one until i saw it on someone else's list like i said i do do some research when making these lists to make sure i don't overlook something and Catan was one i probably would have because when we first started getting into tabletop gaming after the dark times between university and when we started gaming again we were playing Catan every saturday night at my parents house and often those nights had six players and I actually learned to prefer Catan at five to six players. And what that is, the, the big thing that does that is with that many players in between turns, so after everyone finishes their trading, you get a chance to build. So that gives you some reason to pay attention and gives you something to do when it's not necessarily your turn, which helps you focus on the game. Plus, it also made it so that the robber wasn't as bad because when you got six people playing, there's a lot of chances of that robber coming up between your turns. Yeah, and that, well, yeah. 
now this is for Catan, but really any of them. Like there's a five to six player for Seafarers. There's a five to six player for City of the Knights. Um, there's newer ones, Traders and Barbarians. I haven't tried that one, but this is for any of the versions of Catan with the five to six player expansion. And that was Catan with five, six player expansion. All right, another one. I didn't notice until I was putting get, grabbing boxes from downstairs, and that is Libertalia. Now, this one I've had mixed results, but it's usually based on whether I'm playing with new players or experienced ones. This game definitely has a learning curve. With a group who all know the game and know the cards and know what to expect, I've had a great time. And the more people playing, the more interactions that happen, the more things are going to happen in the night phase and everything. But I got to say, the first few games of Libertalia are always a little rough. But I did put this on the list because I know Sean's been playing it, and he knows this one. Well, I don't know about a fan, but it was an amusing play on Board Game Arena amongst the group of, uh, of friends who, who, who all play together. Uh, there's a lot to take in on that game, though. It's a horrible to uh, learn online. Yeah. I, again, oh, in person, too. Oh, okay, because I had no idea what I was doing for the first probably two full games mm -hmm. of playing that game. It just the presentation and uh, yeah you know it's a card game but trying to figure out what's going on with day yeah. and night and cards disappearing and reappearing in people's hands it gets a little confusing but you know when there is some uh some great stuff to happen when you're at the table uh yeah. and there's that, that that sort of you know there's the bluffing and things that are going on and so it's a great uh a great thing when you're right there as long as you don't uh you know anger anyone during the game and you gotta look oh, yeah them. it's definitely a backstabbing game that is not it yeah. that is a game where you may if your friends don't like in your face backstabbing you probably don't want to play libertalia but yeah that, that's the thing is if everyone knows the cards and everyone knows the distribution and how the cards work it plays great but if you don't yeah but maybe being stuck in quarantine now is the time to learn those cards with a group that knows it, it it can play really well well that was libertalia and now for some lighter games once you hit six players, you're quickly entering party game land. Mm -hmm. So here are some quick-to-play, good, larger group games that work great with a party of six. Yeah, starting with one of my favorites, uh, code names. Break into two teams of two, one code giver, two guessers, and you're going to be playing code names for hours. Uh, personally, I think six is the bare minimum for code names. Um, they, that's about how many you need. And now, this is one of those rare games that I admit I did not like at first, but grew on me. So... Even if you usually prefer heavier games or economic games and don't like party games, give Codenames a chance. It worked for me. So that was Codenames. Next, Telestrations. This is a hilarious party game based on the parlor game Eat Poop You Cat. Yes, that is the name of the game. You start off getting a random clue. You then have to draw that clue. Then pass your book. And then you're going to get a clue. You're going to look at what that clue says, and you're going to try it, draw it. And then you're going to pass it over, and then you're going to get a picture, try to write what that picture is, and keep going around until you get your book back. There's probably very little chance that that word at the front matches that picture at the back. Yes, there's a scoring system, but you know what? I, most people just play it as an activity and play until they're sick of it. Yeah, no, Telestrations is great fun. We played it at a couple of uh, the parties down at your place. And it's just hilarious, especially yeah. with a range of artists. Because yes. you, can't, you can't do fantastic art with little right on wipe off markers. But seeing the different levels of art coming from people is mm -hmm. really amusing. So that was Telestrations. All right. One that I just find odd that seems to keep coming up on the show recently. Uh, Skull. I can't remember what, but I know we talked about Skull not that long ago. This is a, a neat auction push your luck game played using coasters. Uh, you create a stack of coasters composing of one skull and a number of flowers. You decide where the skull is. Players then take turns betting on how many coasters they can flip. I can flip four without seeing a skull. And Sean's like, I can flip six. And someone's like, I can flip seven. Like, fine, you can flip seven, do it. And then they try. Go, you, know, you flip, you flip, you flip, and try not to flip a skull. If they do it, they win the round, and you keep playing. But if they're wrong, they're going to lose one of their coasters. You can be completely eliminated out of the game, but the first player to get two right wins the game. It's dead simple. I basically just taught you how to play it without showing you the physical pieces. It is way more fun than I would have thought it should be. And the, the version that's available now, called just called Skull, there's an older printing called Skull and Roses. The artwork on this card has a very uh, Deus de la Muertos look to it that I really dig. It's just a really cool looking game. But you can technically, if you've got a bunch of beer coasters, you can play it at home. Absolutely. I believe uh, our, our uh, mix of gamers and non-gamers episode oh, was one okay. of the last times we've talked about, we talked about that one. And that That's was fair. Skull. 
Next is Cash and Guns. In this game, you are playing a group of gangsters who just finished off the heist of a lifetime. And you're in the process of splitting the loot. And of course, it doesn't go good. You have basically Mexican standoff a game that involves pointing phone guns at your friends. So this may not be for everyone, but if you're cool with the theme, this can be a lot of fun. Note these are not realistic looking weapons, and, but you may not want it in your home if you don't want a game where you're pointing guns at your mother-in-law. Uh, plays better the more people you have. So this is a great six-player game if you're into the theme. And that was Cash and Guns. Uh, Liar's Dice. This is another classic, kind of like Skull, where it's great because most people have everything they need to play in their collection already, especially if you're a gamer. You just need 5d6 and a cup per player. Uh, this is a push-your-luck game where you're going to rattle your dice, you're going to look, and then you're trying to get a better roll than the person on your left. The thing is, you have to beat the person on your left, so you either have better roll better than them or be pretty good at lying at what you have. And of course, when you pass your cup to the next person, when you don't pass it, you go to the next person, they can call your bluff if they think you didn't actually roll better than the other person. Every time you lose, you lose a die. Once all your dice are gone, you're out of the game. Uh, very popular parlor game, party game. There are a ton of variants out there. It, there's a Wikipedia page with a list of variants for Liar's Dice. This is, a, this is a popular big group game. Always has been, probably always will be. And that was Liar's Dice. Uh, concept. Anytime we talk about groups, playing games, and party games, I have to mention concept. This is my favorite party game. This is my favorite clue guessing game where you get a word and you're trying to get everyone else to guess it. Uh, once you've got six people, you got two choices. You can split into teams or do what we do where one person gives out the clues and whoever gets it right, then is the next person giving out the clues and you play until someone's sick of playing. Just literally don't use the scoring that's it's the one game that even like I, i've used the scoring in illustrations i refuse to use the scoring in concepts all right well that was concept all right next vlada shavado is a, a very well-known game designer for producing heavy games that for some reason decided to improve on pictionary or win lose or draw with a game called pictomania uh this is a neat game where there are seven clues for each round and all six people are trying to draw one of those seven things, but you don't know who's drawing what. So there's always one thing that no one's drawing. What's really cool about this game is it's simultaneous play. Everyone's drawing at once and trying to guess at once. It's really neat. And six players is the perfect count for this because of the fact there's seven things. What I like about this is, yes, drawing kind of matters, but no, what's even more important, the deduction. To be able to look, go, well, I'm drawing an apple. Sean's obviously drawing a car. I know those aren't the clue. I'm looking over at D and she's drawing something around. I bet you that's the sun. Like the fact, the thought process used in this game is really neat. And it's that deduction and reasoning combined with the silly drawing game that I really like about Pictomania. And that was Pictomania. All right, Camel Up. This is a very silly racing game uh, and betting game that features one key mechanic that makes the game. And that is the fact that camels stack on top of each other. That's why it's called Camel Up. And then if a camel moves and it has camels above it, they move with it. So it's a really neat racing game using that basic mechanic. Uh, it's got a neat little dice tower that looks like a pyramid the dice come out of. Uh, it's very cool. One of the neat things here is unlike many racing games, you're not playing a specific camel or a specific racer. Just at any point during the game, you can bet on where the individual racers are going to finish. So you can bet on the losing camel or the winning camels. Uh, this one has been a huge huge hit with local gamers of all ages i know people who bought this for their kids and it works great with people of different experience levels something about the the basic theme even non-gamers grasp it right away and that is camel up next is for sale at one time, every game night I attended, literally every WGR game night when I did the Windsor Gaming Resource I attended, started off with a game or two or three of For Sale. This was the game we played until seven people showed up because it played a max of six players. So we're like, oh, there's three of us. Let's play some for, some, some for Sale. Oh, another person showed up. Let's play another round. Oh, we're up to five people. Let's play another round. We're at six people. It's another round. Oh, we're up to seven. Time to split up and start playing something else. Uh, this game is a card-driven game where you play through two rounds. One, you're getting money. Then the second round, you're using the same cards to buy properties. It's a classic game. Uh, probably every podcast that talks about classic games has mentioned this one. This is a fantastic game. It's, it's really quick to teach and plays under half an hour, even at the full player count. And that was For Sale. It's a long list today. I didn't realize how long it was while writing it out. 
Uh, next, we have Bean or Bonanza. Uh, six is, to me, uh, the one of the best player counts for Bonanza. Best count to do bean planting. We've mentioned this one many times in the show, and for good reason. This is one of my favorite games to play with groups of five or more. Uh, the unique mechanic, of course, is that you can't sort your hand, and you're forced to play the first card in your hand every turn. So it's all about making the right trades before the turn order gets back to you so your hand's in shape for planting what you want to plant. Bean or Bonanza. <laughs> Oh, Nanza. We need to make a North American version. It says Bean in great big letters. That's what everyone I know calls it. I Here's an older one from the designer of Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield, The Great Del Moody. This is a ladder-based card game, and it's the one hobby board game that I was literally able to get my relatives to play, like aunts and uncles, even my grandmother at one time. Uh, this is one of those games where you're trying to play a better hand of cards than the person before you in order to get rid of all the cards in your hand. So you're dropping a set number of identical cards. So if someone else drops three nines, you could drop three eights or say three fives, and while three threes would be the, the best thing that could take that particular trick. The goal is to be the first place and to play your entire hand. When played over multiple rounds, that's when this game really shines, is you are assigned roles based on how quickly you are out of cards. Roles from the Great Dalmudi all the way down to the Greater Peon. Now, we like to combine those roles with silly hats and costuming, and we even have like a big medallion for the Dalmudi to wear. Plus, there are actual rules in the game that you can play with where everyone gets to boss around the Peon. And when we play, that's the person who has to go get everyone's drinks. And that was the Great Dalmudi. All right, San Francisco Cable Car or Just Cable Car or I think the other version is New York. There's a few different printings of this game. Uh, this is an excellent tile playing game that maxes out at six. And for me, the more players you play with, the more cutthroat it becomes. And to me, the more fun. There's the base game where you're trying to get your cars to have the longest routes, getting bonus points for getting to the center. Or if you're more uh, into economic games and gaming, you can swap it up. So instead you're buying stocks in the various colors. And then you none of it, you don't own any. And that makes the game much more deep and uh, strategic. So both methods of play are just as valid. Both are fun. One better for non-gamers, one better for hardcore gamers. And that was San Francisco Cable Car. And my last recommendation of the night, and that is New York Slice. Uh, this surprisingly thematic game, the lead player builds a piece of other tiles and then has to divide it up into a number of portions based on the number of players. Then each player is going to choose their own portion. The interesting bit is the person who split it up gets to pick last, so they better be careful with how they split that pizza. Now, the slices come in different types and are worth points based on how many of each slice there are in the game. At the end of the game, only players who have the most of each type are going to score points for those slices. There's also some rules about eating slices and getting points for pepperonis, losing points for sardines, and then there's a thing with the special order of the day that gets tossed on one of the portions which the person who gets that portion can break the rule in a certain way. But this is actually a really simple game, really easy to teach, great party game, uh, and light game with some strategy involved. Like there, there's definitely more of a game here than you first think when you first play it. I also often play this multiple rounds in a row because of how quick it is. There is one big problem, though, is when you finish, you're going to want pizza. And if you don't have readily accessible pizza, that can be a little frustrating. Well, I got to say, I'm upset. I don't think sardines should be a negative. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with seafood on pizza. <laughs> One of the variant rules is actually to swap it so that the, the pepperonis are the negative points and the sardines are worth points. But yes, in the basic rules, sardines are worth minus three points. And that was New York Slice. Now, for some honorable mentions, these are either games that we're not big fans of or that Mo hasn't played, but that yep. many other people strongly recommend at six players. We're not going to go into detail about these, but just run through the list quite quickly. All right, so the top one here is Game of Thrones, the board game, second edition. I played the first edition. It was fun. I've heard second edition is better. I'm not a huge Game of Thrones fan. Uh, next is Cosmic Encounter. Everyone seems to love this game. Everyone but me. Uh, Dune. Still haven't gotten to try this one, but I hear that to really see the game, you have to play with the max, which is six players. You need all the players to get the full experience. Uh, the classic game Civilization from Avalon Hill. Uh, I have a friend who swears it's the best game ever made by man. I don't know. Uh, Betrayal of House on the Hill. This is another one everyone seems to love but me. Personally, I find it far too random. It can be great, but it can be terrible. 
and I'm not usually willing to take that chance of playing a terrible game. Uh, then the Zombicide games. There's a ton of these out there now with different themes, sci-fi, fantasy, or um, modern horror. Uh, I thought it was well done, but it just, I don't know, it didn't grip me. I, I had the fantasy one, and I sold my copy after five plays, but I know people who love them. Uh, of course, Werewolf and all the various editions and versions of White Knight Ultimate being better, because for the full Werewolf, you really need more than six people. But all the One Knight versions, One Knight Vampire, One Knight Werewolf, One Knight, I don't even know, Superhero, Supervillain, I think there is. Uh, everyone knows how I feel about most of the social deduction games, but they're definitely popular. Uh, Jamaica, a pirate-themed racing game, did not do it for me, but I see it recommended all the time at six players. So people out there must love it. I admit I didn't try it at six. I only tried it at three. And then my final recommendation I've seen by many people is Arkham Horror. Now, I only played this with five players, and I found it to be a painful five-plus hours of other people telling me where to move my meeple and reading cards to me. But you know what? Everyone else seemed to enjoy it. I Maybe I just played with the wrong group. All right. Well, we're going to hop into the lobby here. So we've had a lot of chat going on uh, throughout this. Uh, it's good. And not just pizza rolls. So <laughs> uh, Red, Red Meeple Ryan was right up close. He uh, he jumped in as we were reviewing Red, Formula D, but did mention both Jamaica and Camel Up, which we got to eventually. There you go. We got to those. Yep. Uh, Poncho72 was, met, was mem uh, mentioning that he saw a big board gamer and they had a Hex Encounter war game with huge maps and 1,800 plus counters. Perfect for six players. There you go. I'm, I'm the sure they're out there. All right. What I'm trying to do is get the ones from the chat people recommended so we can toss them in the show notes. So we have any six players we missed. Uh, so uh, let's see. What have we got here? Um, good. Uh, no. Trying to see which uh, which ones are clearly. Like I, said, uh, I, I did see Illuminati. Six player Sagrada. Sagrada plays six? I didn't think it went up that high. Fair enough. Uh, apparently, the new version of Camel Up has camels that go backwards. I've heard that. See, the problem is I wasn't willing to buy a game I already bought. I hate when they upgrade. Like, they put a plastic dice thing in there, but I bought Camel Up and the expansion. Now I feel like my version's useless. That bugged me. <laughs> uh, Illuminati. Uh, CI4. We've got Illuminati does six. Yeah, I got that. Unlimited Audi. Yeah. I wish I knew what the Hex Encounter War game was with huge maps. I think he may have been joking, but that's okay. All right. I uh, played a 12 player Battletech game that didn't finish, and we played for 12 hours. <laughs> I see people liking some of our re recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Empires Age of Discovery. Uh, Edge Gale is pointing out that she's not a fan of Jamaica unless everyone is new to it. Okay, everyone's new. <laughs> so if there aren't people who know the game already. Oh. Ryan's got a few more here. Jet Set, Sorry, Howard just... Ritt the Card Game, Inca Gold, yeah, you and just... Steampunk Rally. You uh, you froze up on us and are shrunk right now, but... Oh, jeez. We'll, we'll well, wait again, you... at least it hit the lobby. You're in the lobby, exactly. We've been going good all night. Uh, Tiny Towns, does that play six? Tiny Towns should be nope. good at six. Two to four. Oh, it's two to four. Okay, I'm like, it, it, you know what? You just need more resources. Or no, sorry, like, you no, just no, have sorry. more resources. Tiny, Tiny, Tiny Towns plays six, but is highly not recommended at six. Because Lords of oh, Vegas, okay. Lords of Vegas is only two to four. Ah, uh, okay. Flashpoint is fun but frustrating. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, oh, so King of New five... York. See, King of New York. I personally prefer Tokyo. New York just felt fiddly. And, and Sagrada has the five to six expansion. That's oh, there's that's a, okay. See, I don't have the expansion. Though I'm willing to put it down. I'll toss it down. I know we had a little it's longer than It's not like you don't trust list. Sagrada as a good game. Oh, Deanna loves it. Yeah. I've heard it's better I, with the expansion. I don't mind it. I just find there's other games that do similar better. I've got a lot of fans of it uh, on my feed, so... I feel yeah, like, like I said, uh, it's, it's definitely popular. I just didn't think of it as a six-player game at all. All right, covered. so we got Illuminati, Martian Dice, Sagrada with the Expansion, Empire's Age of Discovery, Jet Set, Ink and Gold, and Steampunk Rally from our chat room. Flux is not... I will never recommend Flux. And apparently Danielle and I, the next time we get together for a con, are going out for anchovies on pizza. Oh, there you <laughs> Deanna will do anchovies. She right. happily do anchovies. Right. I'm the one that doesn't like it. 
no, not no I, I do not. We definitely did mention Catan. Yeah, uh, yeah Flux, I, re I refuse to recommend Flux because the game might not end. <laughs> I think Munch can play six technically too for a similar style of take that game that may not end. Uh, Flux I mean, is fun if it ends. Well, that's one of the can. things. And, and with Flux, it, it also helps. Like if you've got a group of six players, you've got to try and find the Flux theme that everyone yeah, that enjoys, fits. right? Like if yeah. if you've only got two Doctor Who fans, Flux Doctor Who or whatever, you know, might not work. Or if you've only got one Monty Python uh, fan, Flux Monty Python is probably not going to be the best yeah. choice. And especially the theme ones make you do silly things that are tied to the theme. Like, like there's a reason. Like, on Monty Python Flux, you have to do Monty Python quotes, or you have to talk with an outrageous accent, or you have to walk silly, or you have to bang your hands together like coconuts. Like, there, there's a reason they're themed. They actually are themed. And that's part of why I would not want... Uh, yep. I would not want to play any of those. Like I said, definitely not. I am not a Flux fan. Yep. I've tried multiple versions. It's it's okay. I Flux is one game where twice I played and did not get a turn. And from that point on... I have not liked Flux. Now, from what I understand, we were playing with more people than it's supposed to, so that could have been why. So I did give it another shot, and I was like, I can see the appeal of this. More so for non-gamers, right? You know, if there's six of you, and you just got your beer delivery from the local chapter craft beer place that's open during the pandemic, and they drop that off, and you're going to start just, you know, you're just there to have a good time, and the game's something that's happening while you're having a good time. Sure, Flux is great for that. So I'd rather play Skull, for example, but... Like the Star Trek Flux, I thought was kind of interesting. And yeah. I'm not a huge fan of the Creeper rules that they introduced, where you can't win if this card's in front of you, because it just makes the game even longer. Right. All right, well, that was an uh, excellent lobby. And now, up next, a look at a two-player card game, The Fox in the Forest. Uh, the Fox in the Forest was designed by Joshua Burgo and features art by Jennifer L. Meyer and Keith Pichirny. It was co-produced by two publishers, Foxtrot Games and Renegade Game Studio. Uh, that is North American. I'm not sure if it's published by other publishers other parts of the world. Uh, it was published here in North America in 2017. Uh, plays two players only. This is a two-player exclusive card game, and it takes about half an hour to play through a full round of games. Now, normally we'd point you to an unboxing video right now, but we don't have one. No, we don't, actually, because this is, I think, the first time ever I'm reviewing a game I don't actually own. Uh, the copy of Fox in the Forest we have is on loan from a local gamer, Terry Latorco, who was awesome enough to lend it to me to take part in the Renegade Games Worldwide Play Day last Wednesday. Uh, which you can see our video of and everything. So it's not my copy, so I didn't get to open it, so no unboxing video. Regardless, this is a card game, so I'm guessing you get cards? Uh, yep. A uh, total of 33 cards. Actually, 35 cards, really. 33 cards split over three different suits. Uh, the suits are moons, bells, and keys. And then there's two summary cards, so 35 cards total. Uh, there are some scoring tokens, which I would assume came on a punch board originally. Uh, component quality is, I would say, standard. Uh, they're cards. They feel like cards. They look like cards. Uh, the chits are fine. Uh, I do want to note, though, that the artwork is fantastic. I really like the art on the cards, though it's not on all of them. So half the cards just look like standard playing cards, and the other half have artwork on it. It's the odd-numbered cards. And they have that really good fairy tale theme to them. All right, so we've got three suites of 11 cards each. What are we doing with them? All right, so this is a two-player trick-taking game, which I know... I assume you're like me and you're thinking, how the heck does trick-taking work with only two players? And that's exactly what I thought when I first heard about this game. And I'll explain quickly how it works, and I think, I think you'll get it. It's really kind of brilliant the way it works. So you start each round dealing 13 cards for each player. That leaves seven cards in the deck. You're going to flip over the top card of the deck, called, and it's called the Decree card. That sets the trump. So one of the three suits is trump. The non-dealer is going to lead, and you're going to play 13 tricks. You're going to play all 13 cards in your hand. Now, at this point, standard trick-taking rules. You have to follow suit. If you don't have the lead suit, you can throw off suit. Uh, the winning trick is the one with the highest trump, or if no trump has been played, the highest card in the lead suit. Pretty standard trick-taking. I just explained euchre, spades, hearts, trick-taking, exactly the same. So what is it that makes this different than all the other games you just listed? All right, so what we've got here is that, first off, every odd-numbered card has a special ability. And that happens the instant you play the card down. 
So for example, the one is this one card. What that lets you do is you get the lead in the next hand, even if you lose the trick, which you're probably going to with a one card. The fox card is the number three, for example, and that lets you swap a card in your hand with the decree card. So you can potentially swap the trump in the middle of a trick. Another example is the woodcutter, which lets you take a card from the top of the deck and replace and place one of the cards in your hand to the bottom of the deck and so on. The, the 7, 11, and 9 also do things. So there's unique abilities on half the cards. So there's a little bit of Goris Maximus in there almost, yes. except it's a two-player game, and there's actually more ways to play with the uh, play with your, with your hand. Yes, yeah, exactly. And then the other thing that makes this work is the scoring. Because if the whole goal was to just take every trick every round, it would be simple and probably not all that much fun. So each round has 13 tricks, right? 13 cards in your hand. You're going to play through all three. And in general, you want the majority. You're actually aiming to win seven to nine of the tricks, and that's going to get you six points. That's the biggest point value in the game. Now, your opponent's only going to get one to three points, depending on what they got in their number of tricks, the opposite of it. The thing is, you don't want that one more. You don't want 10 to 13 tricks, because if you do, and this is going to the fairy tale theme, you're considered too greedy. And you get zero points, whereas your opponent is considered humble and scores six points. And it's that having to balance how many takes tricks you take combined with those odd number card power abilities that makes Fox in the Forest Fox in the Forest, not just the standard trick taking game. And that's what makes it work with only two players. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the mechanics and, and you'll you'll get a little bit more, but what is the theme of Fox in the Forest? Uh, it's a, it's a fairy tale theme, so I admit I didn't do the click through. There's a bit of a fairy tale story, a poem that's in the game, and if you go to uh, the Renegade Games website, you can get the full poem. It was written for the game, or the game was written for the poem. Like it's not like a popular medieval poem. It's not like a a Brothers Grimm specific takeoff. But there's foxes, there's um, swans, there's a witch. I I admit I didn't do the research. You know me, my love of theme. <laughs> I gotta say the art looks great. You, like you got and the nice part is the, the suits are different. So like a three is always a fox, but the fox of moons is this like dark shadowy fox. The fox of um, uh, bells looks like your standard red fox. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what the key fox looks like, but it's unique art for each of the three suits. And like I said, there, then there's this whole poem that this is all tied to in some way. And I admit it, I, I'm I'm not a th huge theme person, so I just enjoy playing the trick taking game. <laughs> Right. So a full game is played to 21 points, and so far that seems to take just under about half an hour from when we played it. Uh, we've yet to see any runaway leaders, and games seem to take about three to five hands to get to that 21 points. And it does seem to go back and forth. It's not like, you know, someone gets six, the next turn they get six, the next turn they get six, and they just steamroll it. Overall, I gotta say, I am impressed by this game. I am really, uh, this is one I skipped. I completely overlooked this. It uh, came out in 2017. I don't know if podcasts talked about it or not. If they did, they probably said two-player trick-taking game, and I just checked out. I'm like, eh, whatever. I, I, how can a trick-taking game be good with two players, right? It's like if you say two-player auction game, I'm probably not going to be interested. But now that I've seen how well Fox in the Forest does this, it's now on my wish list. So like I said, I don't actually own one of this game. But the other thing with Fox in the Forest that really is a big draw for me is it's one of those two-player, small footprint, strategic game uh, that are the type Deanna and I love. These are the kinds of games that we pack when we leave the house. This isn't something we're probably going to go in our basement and play, but this is the kind of game like the Duke or Onitama or Hive that we're going to throw in Deanna's purse and we're going to go to the same with Brewing Company and have a couple pints of beer and play some Fox in the Forest. Or we're going to bring it with us when we go on vacation to play at the hotel or at, at, the, at a bar. Um, this, this is it's just one of those games that hits that sweet spot. And to me, because of that, I actually went back to our two-player date night game article and added this game on the list because I think it definitely belongs there with other games like the Duke and Onitama. All right. Now, if you dig card games, like trick-taking card games, this is a no-brainer to me. Like, if you like Euchre, Spades, Hearts, just pick this up. You're gonna If you have someone to play them with, you're going to dig Fox in the Forest. It's a, it's a nice twist on those kind of games. Now, if you're not, like, to me, trick-taking is ubiquitous, but I know there are people out there who have never played a trick-taking game. I think this would be a great intro to trick-taking, especially with only having two people to worry about in two hands. You don't have to worry about trying to remember what your partner has or anything like that. So I think it would be a really good intro to trick-taking. I also think it played well with kids, though I have to admit I didn't get a chance to try it myself. 
Um, though I do know there's some people out there that don't like card games, don't like trick taking games at all. I, this isn't going to win you over. I don't think this isn't going to, going to sell you on playing a trick taking game, but otherwise uh, this comes very strongly recommended for me. If you've never played a trick taking game, I wonder what was your high school like? Do they still play cards in high school? I don't know. I've, it's been a I, long I time, but I, I can't imagine high school without card games at lunchtime. Now it's, I'm sure maybe they don't do that anymore, but that's maybe they don't. I don't. I just I know I have met people where I've been like blah 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 trick taking, and they went what? Like I I can't even remember who it was local. It was at the CG realm. I remember Roger was also playing, and I was trying to teach. I think it was Goris Maximus, and there was someone who had not had experience. So like like poker, spades, hearts. Like no, I've never played any of those. So I had to explain like the, what trick meant and what right. taking a trick meant and what Trump meant when we're not talking about presidents. <laughs> All right. Well. For a more in-depth look at the Fox in the Forest, you have a couple of options. For one, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews to read Mo's full review there. Or you can head over to YouTube mm -hmm. where you can find an actual play video from last week's Renegade Games Worldwide Play Day. That video include, includes a teach of the game and a playthrough of two full rounds. And now... The Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, um, any events we attended, which not a lot right now, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Now, I've got an interesting mix of digital and physical games this week, and I, you know what? I'm going to go with uh, chronological here, so the order we played the games. So, up first... I got to try Jaipur. This is one that has come up many times. I played it with Sean over Board Game Arena. He invited me to a game after our last episode. Uh, this is one that multiple people have recommended every time we talk about two-player games. It's one of the most recommended two-player games that I had not played. And I wanted to uh, understand why. And having now played, I can see why so many people are definitely pushing this one. Uh, this is a very interesting card-driven set collection game. It's basically a card drafting game where the cards are in the middle of the table with a really interesting set of mechanics for what you can take when. So there's a row of cards. You can take all the camel cards, or you can take one card, or you can trade cards in your hands for the cards on the table, but you have to trade at least two. And then there's a limit where you can only hold seven resource cards, but any number of camels, which is kind of strange. Now, the resource cards are sold, and they're traded for tokens, and the tokens are worth diminishing points, which is something I totally missed at the beginning of the game. It makes a big difference. So the first yellow, whatever yellow is, is worth, say, 10 points, and the next one's worth 9, then 7, then 6, then 5, in general, for selling these. So you get tokens for selling your cards, and then you get bonus tokens if you sell 3, 4, or 5 at a time. That's basically the over gist, overall gist of how it plays without getting into the details of what the commodities are, how many colors, or any of that. I found this game worked really well. And, man, the board game arena interface was great. Though I admit I haven't played the physical version. But I got to say, I bet you the board game arena is smoother because I'm just imagining the stacks of all these tokens and having them set them up between rounds seems like it'd be a real pain in the butt. Yeah, indeed. The fact that you can play best two out of three hands with essentially zero downtime yeah. really makes the, it a great card filler online. But... Even in real uh, person, you're really only talking about two or three minutes between both rounds. If players are helping to reset, you know, both both players are working to reset all the, the stacks and, and, and reshuffling. Well, there you go. Yeah, I liked it. it, it it's definitely me. I want to try the physical version just to see if there's any difference, but I have to assume it's the exact same game. So I'm not at the point I'm going to throw this on our two-player game recommendations yet because I've only played it on Board Game Arena. I, if anyone in Windsor has got a copy once everything gets normal, I would love to play just one or two hands just to see how it plays out in person, and then I'll definitely toss it on there. i got to say thumbs up, though, overall. So up next, I spent some time on Happy Meeple. It's happymeeple.com, all one word. Uh, well, dot com's not. Uh, this is another online board gaming site that someone pointed out uh, when we were doing research for our last episode. So we actually heard about this before the episode, but didn't have enough time to really deep dive the site to put it on with our other ones. This is a unique site because it feels like a phone app or one of those Facebook games. It's one of those styles of apps where you have an energy rating, and this is food. And to play a game, you have to pay the food. 
And then when you're out of food, you just have to wait a certain amount of time for food to come back, and then you can play again. Or you can just give them money to be able to play more games. And then there's all these in-game currencies, like you earn gold, and then you can use the gold to buy resources. And then you use the resources to do this Farmville thing where you can build up your little village. And I think you do that so you can get food quicker or something. Like, it's it's weird. Yeah, no, I jumped on this one when the lovely people behind the site followed me. I played a few Fair. tutorials, started building my city, but I'll be honest, I haven't even thought about going back since. Uh, the gamification sure. of a gaming experience is a bit much for me personally, but I'm quite sure that there are a lot of folks who would really gravitate to this interface because it's well done. Yeah, it is definitely well done. Like, normally the whole microtransaction-based economy thing would completely turn me off, but Happy Meeple does a really good job of making everything look good. And it has one of my favorite of two-player games of all time, Lost Cities. And I wanted to at least try that. So I stuck around and I made an account and I earned some farm bucks or whatever, some food, and I played some Lost Cities. And I got to say, the site overall is polished. It's nice. Now, what's weird is all the games are two-player games only, which I thought was a just interesting choice to, to specialize in two-player only games. Uh, there aren't a lot of them. I didn't count, say, about nine or ten, maybe. Um, but the individual development on the games are is top-notch. Like They are excellent at versions of these games. Plus, there's the added development of a full walkthrough and tutorial for every game where it literally steps you through the first half of the game and then lets you take over. Uh, there's the ability to play practice games uh, versus bots. You can play games solo, and you can play with your friends and strangers online. Now, as you play, you unlock stuff and get rewards. You unlock different meeples, and there's the whole micro game stuff. And I admit I didn't dive much into that. But to me, that was secondary. The actual games you could play impressed me. Now, what I haven't tried all the games, I did play five games of Lost Cities. Uh, I played versus bots only at this point. And man, Lost Cities is just so good. Like, uh, we have a more recent published version of Lost Cities that I haven't been enjoying. And it made me question that maybe it's, I don't, I, like, I have rose-tinted glasses when thinking about Lost Cities, but no. I played this, and I'm like, no, this is the game I remember. This is the pusher lock, trying to remember what cards have been played. Oh, do I discard this card? Because if I discard it, you might take it. Those, those agonizing decisions. It was everything I loved about Lost Cities. And, like, this is enough that I'll probably keep going back to Happy Meeple just to play more Lost Cities. I had only played Lost City Rivals before this, and I did play uh, five games of Lost Cities vs. Bots. And that, uh, no, sorry, you played five games. Of yes. Cities. I played three. Um, and this is the better version of the game. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, the game and the interface both held up well, didn't disappoint. Very well done. And unlike some of the ones we talked about last week, modern interface. Very, very nicely done. Oddly, it's, it feels like a tile game instead of a card game, but that doesn't really matter. It's just the interface they went through. Uh, the next one I try is a game called Finito. Uh, this was an interesting dice-driven number sorting game that felt like someone sat down and modernized Racco, which is a game from, like, I don't know when it came out. I played it in the 70s and 80s. Uh, this is a fun diversion, but super light. Like, this isn't a lot of, this is no brain-burning challenge. It's like roll a d20 to mark off some things, and then every turn having to rearrange the stuff to try to get all your numbers in order. It sounded neat. Um, I was thinking a physical copy would be pretty cool to own, just for game nights where literal beer and pets old nights, where we're... You know, you gotta. It, at my in my mind, the components are basically waterproof and beer proof, and people are having drinks and possibly putting some money on the game. That's kind of what it felt like. Uh, it seemed like a good game to pull in non gamers as well. Yeah, agreed. It felt like something from one of those digital gaming terminals sitting on the bars. Yeah. it really felt like one of those games. Yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah, that was kind of neat. I, it's nothing I'm gonna rush out and buy. That's for sure. Uh, the last one I tried was a totally new-to-me game that I knew existed. I'd seen it on the market. Fantastic-looking art, and that's Hanamakoji. Now, I've been curious about this game. Uh, it's a Japanese-themed game involving geishas and giving them presents to make the geishas happy. And it was really cool to be able to try it on Happy Meeple. And they did a great job, again, of teaching it. The tutorial was fantastic. This is a neat set collection game where you're trying to, to collect a certain number of geisha and you're doing it by giving them gifts, by impressing the geisha. And it uses a very small number of cards, so it's a very small subset of cards. There are four actions you have to do that you can do, but you have to do all four. And half of those actions involve giving cards to your opponent, which was a very interesting 
mechanic, like an interesting way to think about a game. It was a very different type of card game. I think this would be a great one to play in person, where you were actually like reading the other player and seeing them look at their cards and seeing them, you know, agonize. Uh, digital worked. Like, it worked well enough, and I got to learn the game, but this just seems like it was going to really shine with face-to-place play and some actual, you know, taunting and interactions and go, oh, I put a thing under here, and oh, do you want this or this, right? I, I just think this one really needs to be face-to-face to shine. Yeah, it was it was a really intriguing game, uh, but definitely it, it would be a way stronger game with a person. Uh, I it did it lost something when you were just kind of I'm gonna put this under here and it doesn't yeah. really mean much. It was definitely neat. Uh final game I tried was Keltis. This one surprised me because this is from Rainier Nitzia. Um and Nitsi is the one who designed Lost Cities. And this felt very much like a newer version of Lost Cities. But it was much lighter and more forgiving. Um, it seemed like it was Lost Cities for players who don't like card counting. Like, there is still some card counting in it, but there was definitely way more randomness. Plus, you could start your rows of cards. For anyone who knows Lost Cities, you could start going um, ascending or descending. And that was an open option. So if you started with a high card, you could start staying low, high and start counting down. Whereas you started with low cards, you could go up. And then there was a thing where if you got pairs, you got some points. So there's definitely more randomness to it. It seemed like a dis- decent game. It seemed okay. But overall, I found myself more gravitating towards Lost Cities. Yeah, I soured a bit on this one because my first game against the bot, the bot had a run of pairs to open yeah. the game and collected most of the pair stones away from me before I had any chance. It. So uh, my frustration at that then hurt my overall play, and I ended up getting completely crushed Oof. in it. And it was just sort of like, well, that just wasn't even fun. Uh, yeah. It was supposed to be a you know basic intro tutorial game sort of thing. Ouch. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. So. I don't know. I, I had fun with it. I tried it twice. I didn't. I, didn't, I would recommend giving it at least one more shot, but I so far think Lost Cities is better. It does seem a little more approachable. Now, um, what's interesting, like we're talking like we played each other. We didn't play each other in any of these games. We, I didn't even know what Sean played and what I didn't play. So those were the ones I played. Did you play any I didn't? Uh, I'm trying to think. There was something, and I'm just trying to remember what the heck the name of it was. It was another one that was very much like a... Uh, um uh Finito uh no not Finito. Finito we talked about. Oh Finito I definitely uh, played. I don't remember what very odd so quickly, but it's not low. Oh, level X. That's what I played. Okay, I saw that one in the yeah, list. And again, it was another very sort of on top of the bar, you're you're rolling four dice and arranging them to to get numbers five to twelve, uh, okay. and then the first per- and you need you need to get tokens uh, after you get a certain number of those numbers. Uh, you get tokens. You whoever has the most tokens wins. There's a few different you know if you get the runs of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's sort of a, a a odd version of like sort of a four dice Yahtzee. With okay. a with a sort of press your luck uh, element to it, it was interesting, but again, it, it really felt more like a sort of beer and pretzels gambling sort of thing. Fair enough. That was uh, Level X by Stefan Risthaus. I heard of the designer. Yeah. But yeah, I'll probably be going back to uh, to Happy Meeple again. If we do another, we may do a full episode in the future looking at some of these lesser known sites. If you like two player games, it seems like like the place to go. And if you're into, like I said, the, the whole microtransaction and by playing your games, your own wood, and then you use your wood to build a inn for some reason, that eh, yeah. it might be for you. Yeah, it wasn't for me, but uh, again, a nice site for games, and it's just, it's, the site isn't aimed, direct, aimed at me. So Yeah. Like I said, what I, I was really impressed by the onboarding. It te- walks you through everything, which is really nice, especially compared to like the other sites where you're not good for learning games. Yeah. So speaking of other sites, I actually keep going back to Bois Zoo, and that is to play Town Center. Now, I've been playing this solo because this game is hard, and I'm trying to figure out how to play it better. Now, this is a game I own physically that people either get it right away, and then they love it because it's so unique and different, or they get it right away and never want to play it again. 
or people have a hard enough time figuring it out. They get frustrated and want to quit before the first game's over. Like, this is a polarizing game. People love or hate this game. It's a city-building game that shows you what your, 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 your town center, your population center, and all your types of buildings are represented by cubes. And what's really interesting in this game is that it has a 3D element. And that space, adding that spatial element to a, a, a building game is just such a, a unique twist. Now, the thing is, there's these really odd mechanics, which they call organic growth in the game. And it has to do with when one block is surrounded by other blocks of the right type, the block will grow, getting you free blocks. Like, the actual rule is if you have a bunch of businesses, which are blue, of size N, are touching a number of residences of size N plus one, that business will grow. And you will actually continue to grow as this is true. So if you add another block, your N just went up. And if it's still, there's a number of residences next to it of size N plus one, the business will grow again. And sometimes you don't want growth and your, your businesses will spread out into the suburbs and you lose points for that and stuff. It's, it's a very unique game. That odd organic growth rule and the fact it's 3D is just, it, it breaks people's brains trying to figure this game out. Now, what I like about playing it on Bwat is that it does the work for you. Because in the physical version, it's easy to miss an instance where a block should grow. And they have to. It's not like you're you're missing out on a benefit. Sometimes you don't want things to grow. Whereas when you play on Bwat, you have no choice. Like, it, they highlight and you must grow them before moving on. So the digital interface makes sure, enforces the rules, which is a nice touch. Oh, interestingly, it was uh, last night that I realized that I've had games on Yukata that uh, we've never finished. Uh, and apparently it respects me so thoroughly that it refuses to let me know that games have been <laughs> sitting there for a week unplayed. Wow. Uh, and, and you guys hadn't mentioned anything. So uh, I started playing again last night. And hopefully I'll try and peek through at least until we're through those games, whether <laughs> or not we start up any more. All right. I personally, I'd like to play some Agizia three-player if you've figured it out by now, because I love that game. But other than that, there's not a lot I need to finish. We do have to finish our Terra Mystica game, though. Uh, so, back to chronologically, we go to Sunday night. So this was, uh, we played Terraforming Mars with patron of the show, John Carney. You, too, could be playing games with us each month by backing our patron at this chairs for you level. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'd love to have more patrons to play with. So the four of us on Sunday night played John, Deanna, Sean, and I. We booted up Terraforming Mars on Steam and played through a real-time game uh, using the Corporate Wars and card drafting variants, which I think are the best variants to use. I refuse to play without Corporate Wars, and while drafting, if you've got the time, is definitely the way to play. Uh, I do think it went well, but wow, uh, is that game rough real-time. The problem is... You don't see anything anyone is doing until they finish their turn. So you literally just sit there listening to the bad space opera music. Well, it's not bad. Repetitive space opera music and wondering what other people are doing and maybe looking through your cards and like spinning the planet and clicking around and killing time because nothing happens until someone hits next turn or finish turn. Now, other than that, except for that downtime, it is a great implementation of Terraforming Mars. But I'm starting to think I may only ever play this turn base going forward. Yeah, it was a really nice night, and that's all I'm going to say about uh, my performance. <laughs> now, earlier today, uh, we did get one more game in. Wrapping it up, Deanna and I played and live-streamed a game of Clank, a deck-building adventure. Uh, this was part of Renegade Games' Worldwide Play Day. Um, despite having some technical problems and getting things started a little later than we had hoped, um, I don't know what was going on. Streamlabs totally forgot everything from our last session, which I I don't know. But the game itself was good. It was, uh, it was really close. Deanna managed to escape the dungeon, and I thought I had managed to snag enough treasure to win despite dying uh at least i died above ground i miscalculated final score was 89 to 94 it was so close five points off like if i had just jumped back in and grabbed the monkey treasure before climbing above ground we at least would have tied it was close it was really close and i had no clue who was going to who was going to finish that yeah we've actually who was gonna win that uh you know i don't generally talk too much about all my bga games but we've had some really close ones lately uh, in particular, there was a game of Haggis, uh, which is okay. a fun, you know, fun card game. You know, it's an interesting way of trick playing trick taking. It's there's some really weird combinations you can play that, you know, if you happen to have them dealt out to you, it's great. 
and we finished uh, after three rounds with one point between first and second, and wow. five points between second and third. <laughs> and it was it was tight and really frustrating for for unfortunately not me because I actually won and I didn't think I was going to, but man, wow. again, one point in shootout. So, uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, well, again, I'm hoping to take part in Renegades Worldwide Play Day. Uh, at this point, I don't know what the game is for next week. I was hoping to find out before we were recording tonight, but I did not. Uh, what I will say is for the people who did join us in the chat room earlier, you were all entered in a draw for their giveaway, but I have no idea what they're giving away this week. Uh, they let me know the last time we did it. This time they just said they were giving away some promos. Um so you are all in the draw. So that is something if you can, if we are doing it. So they do these Wednesdays at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, our time, uh, noon Pacific. So next week should be the last one. They said they'd be doing them all April. So April 29th, assuming we own the game, we're going to take part in Renegades Worldwide Play Day. And I will encourage as many people as possible, show up, watch us play for a bit. All you got to do is show up in the chat and say something so we can record your name. Just showing up and watching doesn't count. You got to say something. Just say hi, say what your favorite Renegade game is, whatever you want to say. So we're going to try to take part in that. But again, I don't know what the game is. Um, I I don't know. I own a lot of it. It'd be awesome if it's like Lanterns or something because I love that. Or Lotus or I don't know. Hopefully not Fuse because that is the anti Deanna game. <laughs> but we've got a lot of Renegade games. So there's a good chance it'll be something we have. But if it's not, Unfortunately, we won't be able to take part. Uh, other than that, we um, talked about Terry is the one who lent us Fox in the Forest. She also lent us Fox in the Forest Duet, which I am really curious about. Because now you have a two-player trick-taking game that's cooperative. Which I have no idea how that's going to work. Like the fact that a trick, how is it, how do you have a cooperative trick-taking game? So that'll be interesting. That, that, that I want to try out. Um, actually, if we can, if we get enough plays in, that might be our review for next Wednesday, since that's that's on the pile. Um, I do have some unboxing videos to do, but we're holding off on those. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll get some more games in. I want to play some more games with the kids. I would like to get in some more plays of uh, Woodlands and King Me. King Me was good. Like I'm, That's one of those games where I'm like, man, I feel like playing that. Like I actually sit here during the day, and I'm like, no, what I wouldn't mind playing is King Me. So that's definitely a good sign. And Woodlands, I want to play through at least a couple more of the campaigns to see where they're at. But again, uh, with everything going on in the world today, who knows exactly what's going to happen in the next week. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr., thanks Dave. Brian Kurtz, thanks Brian. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Colin Massey, thank you. Kator, are we even going to remember how to play Gloomhaven when this is done? Like, we're, we have no clue. We're, we're going to have to start playing on easy again, I think, well, by the time we bring that back up. Luckily, you've got your guy in the chair, because apparently you don't even know all the, how to play it all that well before the, the break. That's so, true. You know. <laughs> that is true. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and uh, Ryan says we got to drop the portcullis. Though the doors of the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on.